all sorts of people around the country who can't afford housing, and that is going higher and higher up the income ladder. So there's all sorts of young people, millennial renters, people who work at Facebook, Google, whatever, who can't afford their rent, and they're mobilizing. And it's really fascinating to me because as I was uh, doing the research for the book, I found that people have been talking about this problem. Larry Katz, if you recall, the uh, yeah. old Harvard professor used to call when you were at the Wall Street Journal, when he <laughs> was a college student, he was writing about this problem in the 80s, early 80s. And they all said along the way, well, you could never really make a, a, a constituency out of this hmm. because there's no one to fight for housing that doesn't exist yet. Yes, And these yes. people are trying to do it. And it's kind of a weird conundrum if you think about it, but also something that's really needed. And you ha had this great anecdote in the book that centers around a young woman who showed up to kind of a, your typical city council meeting to fight for a, a building when normally people show up to kind of say, not in my backyard, and, and that kind of crystallized this whole movement. So it's becoming more popular. You can see it in different parts of the country. You can look at Minneapolis, which has been really progressive, I guess you would say, in the way it's now letting people build multifamily or multi-structure dwellings in single-family neighborhoods. Do you think the, the fabric of communities in this country is likely to change as a result of this, or is this just unique to the Bay Area and some of California's wackiness, so to speak? I do not think that the single-family home neighborhood is going to be a relic of the past, but I think that it will be more rare. Uh, Minneapolis, as you noted, uh, became the first major city in America to get rid, to essentially get rid of single-family only zoning. And they're going to allow people to build three, it's not super intense, it's not five-story buildings, mm -hmm. but it's you can build three units on any lot, hmm. right? Uh, but if you look at all the Democratic presidential candidates, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Amy Klobuchar, who's you know from Minnesota, so she's taking from that plan, uh, they all have some sort of zoning component in their plan. Now, whether or not any of those are ever going to really happen, who knows? But it's becoming a statement of purpose that this is not sacrosanct anymore, and that alone is a major change from just two or three years ago. I feel like you kind of got to open the conversation before anything really right. happens. Interesting, the housing is still pretty much regulated on a local level. I don't know if there's that much you could do kind of in the office of the White House, uh, so to speak, to change this overnight. I don't know if something like that is coming. But I wonder, too, how much of this in California is because of, well, well, and to be fair, rent control that Bernie Sanders has talked about uh, taking nationwide and doing something like that. And also, and this is a little esoteric, but not to Californians, Prop 13. I mean, the way that that sort of traps or keeps people in housing and doesn't really pave the way for the next generation of homeowners seems to contribute a lot to this. Well, as a major Prop 13 beneficiary, <laughs> I have mixed feelings about it. But no, I think actually, you know what the real hidden thing about Prop 13 is, isn't so much that it traps people in it, although it does that too, it's that it makes cities hate new housing because they, they don't get higher taxes from it. Interesting. Uh, so, um, they, they're, they, so you look at Palo Alto. Palo Alto is where a lot of tech companies are based. They have four jobs per every housing unit, which is way more than even, like, say, Manhattan. Uh, but they are financially incented to do that because the commercial property returns a lot more than the residential property, which is not the case in New Jersey, where I'm sure you pay high property taxes. Yep. And so what we're seeing is sort of this skewed incentives that encourages places like the Silicon Valley to have way, way, way more jobs than housing units, what do you get? You get three-hour commutes. You get people getting priced out of their homes. You get right. teachers who are, you know, sleeping in their cars. Uh, you know. No, and you've documented all of this. Yeah. So I guess the, the, the point here is while California maybe has policies that could contribute to making it worse and then they're trying to fix that with policy, what about for the rest of the country? What happens if something like rent control goes, goes national because the idea is hey, you know, this is somebody else's fault, and so this is a mechanism that will fix the problem and make my rents much lower, and then I, as somebody who's trapped out of single-family housing, have a more affordable lifestyle. Well, I think there's gonna, we're going to need a mix of policy solutions. As we know, uh, there's not enough housing, and people don't make enough money. How you sort of, you know, the mix of, the solu the mix of how you're going it, to, it's going to be some version of build more housing and subsidize housing for people who can't afford it. That's what's going to, that's what needs to happen. Such a sea change. But, yes, but I think also that um, you're, you're, you're seeing this show up in other cities. I mean, like you said, Minneapolis, Boston, Portland. I mean, any place that isn't like declining has this problem because 
as you know, I mean, tech jobs, finance jobs, they all right. kind of agglomerate in these places. But who, when we were covering the housing crisis and the overbuilding and the ghost community, who would have ever thought just 10 years later here we'd be talking about what a shortage we have? Well, you know, you could kind of actually see it in certain cities at that time, but it was hard to talk about. Absolutely. And now uh, you've done a great book on it. Connor, thanks for joining me. It's Thank great you. to see you again. Good luck with it. Connor Doherty from the New York Times. The book is Golden Gate.